My relationship with Persona Q is a very complicated one. There are many aspects of this game that I like, and just as many that left me both frustrated and disappointed. For those who are unaware, Persona Q was released for the 3DS back in 2014. While Persona spin-offs were nothing new at the time thanks to Persona 4 Arena, what made Persona Q immediately stand out was the fact that this was a full-fledged RPG featuring the casts of Persona 3 and 4 in their prime. While the Arena games gave us a taste of what these two casts teaming up would be like, Persona Q was intended to take this to a whole other level. You see, Persona Q is actually a crossover with another series developed by Atlas called Etrian Odyssey, a series of dungeon crawlers where the main appeal are the gigantic labyrinths you explore. I personally haven't played these games outside of Persona Q, so I'm not sure which mechanics and design choices are from Metroid Odyssey, or new ideas that were introduced or implemented here. I'm going to be judging this game solely as a Megami Tensei fan. This distinction is important because Persona Q is a very polarizing game for me. In order to explain why, I'm going to have to go into a lot of detail, both in terms of story and mechanics. There are not only going to be major spoilers for Persona Q in this video, but I'm also going to be assuming that you've played played P3 and P4 for the sake of being able to reference specific scenes from those games in this video. So, if you don't want to be spoiled, please click off the video now. With that out of the way, let's just dive right into it. Something interesting about Persona Q right off the bat is that you have the choice between two protagonists to play as. For this playthrough, I decided to pick the Persona 4 protagonist because I recently did a run of Persona 3, and thought that this would be a nice change of pace. This choice doesn't affect the main story, but certain events and dialogue will be different depending on who you choose. One of the key differences is actually in the game's opening. In my case, the game opens up at Yasugami's High's Culture Festival. All is well with the investigation team, that is, until they hear the mysterious ringing of a bell from a clock tower. Not only that, but the team also runs into Margaret, who's hosting her own fortune-telling booth that doubles as an access point to the Velvet Room. She explains that the bell toll came from outside of their reality, and requests the group to investigate the Velvet Room. Upon entering, things aren't the way they should be. The Velvet Room looks distorted, and there's two mysterious doors chained up by four locks. That's not all, however, because after the group leaves the Velvet Room, they discover that they're in an alternate reality version of Yasugami High. This is signified by the different festival displays as well as the clock tower that appeared in the courtyard. After some investigation, the team discovers that the different class exhibits lead into dangerous labyrinths. Inside of these areas, the group has access to their personas. At first, they believe they somehow managed to make their way into the TV world, but it's quickly disproven when they come across these two students named Zen and Rei. These two have amnesia, but have apparently been here in the school for a long time. They explain that they can't leave the school through the front doors, but believe that the answers they seek will be at the bottom of the labyrinth. While Zen and Rei don't have personas, they can still defend themselves from shadows with their weapons and special skills. If you were to pick the Persona 3 route, then things would play out just a little differently. During a routine visit to Tartarus, everyone suddenly finds themselves in the Velvet Room with Elizabeth and Theodore. Before we can get any answers as to what's going on, the elevator suddenly begins to plummet into darkness. When Seas comes to, they find themselves in the alternate Yasugami High where they meet Zen and Rei. It's at the end of the first dungeon when either Seas or the investigation team arrive to provide some much needed backup against the boss. After things calm down and the teams make their formal introductions, we discover that by clearing the first dungeon, one of the locks on the two doors in the Velvet Room has been broken off. Not only that, but Zen and Rei regain some of their memories. And with that, our characters' goals are in sight. Seas and the investigation team are going to have to join forces to clear out the remaining labyrinths in order to return home, while also restoring Zen and Rei's memories along the way. That's the basic plot setup to Persona Q, and despite being very front-loaded, not a whole lot happens until near the end of the game. After the other team joins your party, the main story quickly takes a back seat as the dungeon crawling takes center stage. There are a few cutscenes sprinkled here and there, mostly to provide quick comedic relief, but there isn't much in terms of genuine character growth, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Persona Q plays very differently from what mainline fans are probably used to. As I mentioned earlier, the game takes a lot of its design and mechanics from the Etrian Odyssey series. This means that almost all of the playtime is spent going through winding labyrinths and fighting random encounters. Much like Persona 1, you travel through these dungeons in a first-person perspective. Encounters are completely random, but thanks to this icon in the corner here, you get a good idea when they may occur. The biggest gimmick, however, is the fact that you have to manually draw out your map on the bottom screen. There's plenty of options and icons you can place in order to customize your map to your liking, though this is mostly optional because you can turn on auto mapping in the options screen. This doesn't completely eliminate this requirement, however, as you still need to place icons such as doors, stairs, chests, and shortcuts manually. 
I find it odd that auto mapping doesn't, at the very least, place down the icon for doors and shortcuts. I only mention this because of how often you have to stop in place to do this yourself. It gets very annoying and tedious very quickly. You can just ignore placing these icons, but then you're actively making the game harder for yourself. I thought the point of auto mapping was to let players ignore that aspect of the game if they weren't interested in it. There is some satisfaction to be had when making your ideal map, and the game even incentivizes you to fill out each floor 100% by giving you some decent accessories. But in order to have map percentage registered, you have to physically step on each of the tiles and open all of the chests. So at that point, why not just have everything autofill? I know that this is such a weird thing to focus on, but let me just say this is the least of Persona Q's problems. Persona Q's main combat mechanics are actually pretty decent. They remind me of Persona 1's, but with a few more mechanics added to keep things interesting. Your party consists of five active members. You select your skills at the start of the turn, and the order your characters act in is based on their agility stat. By exploiting the enemy's weaknesses or landing a critical hit, instead of being rewarded with a one more, your character will instead earn a boost. Boosted party members take priority over everything else, meaning that they'll act first, no matter what their agility stat is. You're also provided the benefit of having your skills cause zero HP and SP. Your boost will be removed if the party member takes any damage, or performs an action that doesn't yield another boost. That's not all, because depending on how many characters you have boosted, there's a chance that you can perform an all-out attack at the end of your turn. You need the minimum of three party members boosted if you want a chance of this happening. The more characters that are boosted, the higher the odds. You should pretty much always accept this when given the chance, because it's just free damage. Hell, if you want to fight with an all-out attack, you'll even gain extra experience. All-out attacks are pretty out of your control, because there's always a chance that your party member can lose their boosted state by getting hit or just by missing. So it's not something you can rely on like the other person. Persona games. The boosted state is pretty integral to the combat system, because you'll quickly realize that the SP cost of skills in this game is ridiculously high, especially late game magic like Agidine. This is the main reason as to why the boosted state itself is so useful. If you get lucky and land a critical hit, or use a weaker skill to enter the boosted state, then you can cast a very powerful skill for free, assuming that you don't get interrupted of course. Your SP pool at the beginning of the game is pitiful, but after you clear the first floor of the starting dungeon, you'll unlock a workaround for this. Due to the nature of this world, the protagonist is no longer the only person that's able to wield multiple personas. You can equip sub-personas for both the protagonist and the rest of the party. Party members on their own only have access to a very limited skill selection, but by equipping sub-personas, you can not only expand their skill pool, but also give characters access to more HP and SP. What's special about this bonus HP and SP is that it regenerates in between battles, meaning that the high SP cost can potentially become a non-issue. There are two ways of getting new sub-personas. You can either Either win them at the end of an encounter, or you can take the ones that you're no longer using to the Velvet Room for a fusion. While performing a fusion, you can choose what skills are inherited from the old personas. It's very much like Persona 4 Golden in that regard. Unlike the PS1 trilogy, you can actually equip any sub-persona to any character. But you should always be mindful as to who will benefit from their skill selection. Giving a character like Kanji a sub-persona that specializes in magic would be pointless because his strength stat is his best attribute. There are some accessories that swap certain character stats around, but I didn't find them necessary. I personally just stuck with giving my characters accessories that would improve their current build, rather than trying to force them down a new path. Much like the previous Persona games, Persona Q features skill cards. You can use these to teach your party members new skills that they can't learn naturally, and can access even without having a sub-persona equipped. You can extract a skill card from a sub-persona in the Velvet Room by paying yen. The prices will vary depending on the skill and which card you get from the persona is fixed. But this system adds even more potential layers of customization to the characters. I use skill cards a lot to make up for any skills that my party members were lacking in, such as giving Kanji the skill Power Charged, or the Persona 3 protagonist some party-wide healing abilities. The core combat mechanics on paper are actually very interesting, but the execution of these ideas end up leaving a lot to be desired. To run down the list real quick, there's a staggering amount of playable party members you have access to. After the first dungeon, you have a total of 16 characters to choose from when constructing a party of 5 members. While on the surface this does offer plenty of opportunities to form your dream party composition, the problem is that none of these backup characters gain any experience from battle, meaning that if you decide to commit to a certain team for a good majority 
majority of the game, and decide to switch things up because you find that one character is lacking, then anyone new you pick up will be severely underleveled. It's honestly shocking that for a game with a cast this large, that there's no way to keep everybody viable. It's worth mentioning that any requests that reward experience will be distributed to every character in the game, but it's not nearly enough for the backup members to keep up with the main party. Persona Q's overall combat balance is also something that needs to be called into question. With the right setup, characters can become incredibly overpowered. One of the more infamous examples is giving Naoto the passive skill Impure Reach. This skill increases the chance for status ailments, binding skills, and instant kill attacks to land. This makes her the single best character to use against random encounters, because her instant kill attacks almost always land unless the enemy blocks light or dark damage. She's also great to use when you just want to bind enemies due to her insanely high luck stat. I guess is also hilariously overpowered with the right setup. I made her my heavy damage dealer by abusing her Orgia mode and giving her access to the skill Shura Tensei. This move drains your HP at the end of every turn, but boosts your attack power to an insane degree. It was to the point where I managed to one-shot the final boss completely by accident. These two skills that I just mentioned are also pretty easy to get on these characters thanks to skill cards, but you don't get access to the ability to make skill cards until halfway through the game. While you can ignore using these characters, the problem is that the game encourages this type of playstyle. Persona Q has a very kill or be killed mindset, because enemies can do a crazy amount of damage to the party. The game even suggests early on to abuse the bind skills so you can refrain from taking any damage. A much more elegant solution to avoiding damage is to just kill everything with Naoto before the enemies even get the chance. Just make sure you pick skills in case Naoto misses for whatever reason, and you're pretty much golden for the dungeon. I think that this problem could have been solved if the effectiveness in light and dark skills were cut in half. Once you discover how overpowered they are, it's hard to resist the temptation of abusing that power. Despite how unbalanced the game can be at times, I actually did have some fun with the core combat mechanics. It at the very least never became boring. I'm the kind of player that likes to maximize the effectiveness of my party, so there was always a goal that I was working towards and satisfaction for when I was doing insane amounts of damage per turn. The game never became innocent sin levels of easy, but I think you might be better off playing the game on a difficulty that's at least higher than the standard one. I still prefer the combat mechanics from the mainline games, but what's here isn't terrible. But my problems with Persona Q's gameplay sadly don't just end with the core mechanics. A lot of the aspects surrounding the combat are what I take issue with. Battling is only half of the equation in Persona Q. There's just as much, if not more, emphasis put into the actual dungeon crawling. It's easily the most difficult part of the game too, and will be the make or break aspect for your enjoyment of this title. There's a total of five labyrinths to explore, all of which range in terms of complexity, length, and gimmicks. Those being you in Wonderland, the group Date Cafe, the Evil Spirits Club, the Inaba Pride Exhibit, and finally, the Clock Tower. While it may seem like a small selection on paper, these are actually very meaty dungeons. A universal gimmick that's shared with every dungeon is the inclusion of these powerful enemies known as FOEs. FOEs, unlike other enemies, are actually visible during exploration, and act as an obstacle for the player. Much like the dungeons themselves, FOEs also range in terms of complexity. Take for example the card soldiers at the beginning of the game. These guys move on a set path and are easily avoidable because of it. Compare this to one of the muscle dudes in the Inaba Pride exhibit that actively chases you down, but can be warded off thanks to the holy flame you have to carry. FOE manipulation is a large part of Persona Q's dungeon design. More often than not, FOEs are usually placed in a way to directly block your path. The few exceptions that don't move are still something you need to be aware of, such as these cupid guys that can charm you into walking directly into them. FOEs are actually a pretty good idea to keep the dungeon design fresh, but a problem I have with them is just how much trial and error is involved. You're taught early on that there's always a way to circumvent FOEs. To once again use the card soldier as an example, you can wash the paint off of these roses to distract the FOE long enough to sneak by. This is done a couple of times throughout the dungeon, and is used one final time before the end where you need to distract three FOEs in the way that will allow you to slip by. Not only is this dungeon supposed to test you on what you just learned, but it also teaches you that FOE positioning when solving a puzzle is integral. At first, this doesn't seem so bad, but later on in the game, you need to be so precise with how you move and where the FOE is on the map. There are plenty of points where I swear the only way to progress is to get caught by an FOE. There's this one FOE in the Spirit Club that moves faster than your party, meaning that you need to use these few light sources to slow the thing down. On its own, this isn't bad, but there's a puzzle that requires you to set up the lights in such a way that the FOE ends up getting trapped with nowhere to go. 
To do this, you need to bait it into a certain spot on the map, but I swear you can't do this without getting caught. And if there is a proper solution to this puzzle, then I think it's poorly conveyed. But that doesn't even compare to what I consider to be the worst dungeon in the game. Yep, I'm talking about the Inaba Pride exhibit. This dungeon can get fucked. There's just too much multitasking in here for it to be fun for me. The main gimmick here is that you need to light a torch and bring the flame to these doors with the red seals to pass through them. The torch only stays lit for 10 steps, so you need to bring the torch to these bonfires so you can preserve the flame and relight it in case you mess up. By itself, it isn't too bad, but very quickly we're shown that FOEs respond differently to you when you have the torch lit. This labyrinth takes this idea to the extreme and makes it more frustrating than interesting. You need to be so accurate, so precise, that not only do you move in a way that doesn't end with your torch being extinguished, but you also have to make sure the FOEs move in the exact way they need to be. There is a workaround if you don't want to deal with the FOE puzzles. If you're prepared enough, you can actually just fight FOEs. If you manage to kill it, then the FOE will disappear from the map until you leave the floor. I was so fed up with the puzzles by the end of the Inaba Pride exhibit that I just ended up fighting FOEs instead of solving the puzzles. I'm actually really mixed on this idea. On one hand, it feels really good to finally take down an FOE that was giving you shit, but on the other hand, it sort of defeats the purpose of having a puzzle if by the end of the game, fighting FOEs becomes easier than avoiding them. I'll be honest when I say I have no idea how to solve any of the FOE puzzles in the final dungeon of the game. I just couldn't be bothered to figure them out because my party was so strong that I could just defeat them in a few turns. But other than the FOEs, the dungeons are pretty alright. I think that some of the floors in the later half of the game go on for far too long, but the level design wasn't that bad. There are many shortcuts you can find that act sort of as a checkpoint, so if you need to leave the dungeon to heal or sell materials, then you can quickly get back to where you were. Something that I'm not a big fan of is the very limited inventory space you have to work with. You can only hold a total of 60 items on your person at one time. This includes things such as weapons or armor that you haven't equipped yet. The only way to earn money in Persona Q is by selling materials earned from defeating enemies, or the ones you can gather from power spots around the dungeon. This space fills up surprisingly quickly, especially if you decide to bring things such as revival beads or items that can remove ailments. I understand that this is the game's way of subtly pushing you to have spells that accomplish the same things as these items, but the entire point of having these items to begin with is to save SP. I ended up rarely buying any items outside of the standard Goho M's, and later on in the game, the items that would lower the encounter rate. There really should have been a way to upgrade how much storage you have in your inventory, or this limit shouldn't have been here at all. Maybe just have the materials sell for less money in order to balance having unlimited space. I know that this is just a nitpick, but it's something that I thought was worth mentioning. I know that a a lot of the things I've criticized stem more so from the Etrian Odyssey side of this crossover rather than design elements lifted from Persona, but that's more so from the execution of the ideas used here rather than the concept in general. I like the idea of FOEs, it's just that Persona Q goes absolutely overboard with how they want you to interact with them. I like a lot of the ideas here, except the limited inventory space, but a lot of them aren't exactly executed well in my eyes. As a reminder, I haven't played Etrian Odyssey at the time of this recording. What I've criticized here could very well be a non-issue in one of those mainline games, but I'm not exactly going to play through multiple full-length RPGs just to compare it to one game. My experience with Persona Q won't influence my opinion on Etrian Odyssey as a whole for whenever I get around to actually playing it, but I will say that the design and mechanics used in Persona Q could have used a lot more polish and reworks. From what I've heard, Persona Q2 is a much better game as a whole. I haven't gotten around to playing it myself, but from what I've seen, they changed some things to be more like a mainline Persona game. Anyways, Persona Q has a surprising amount of optional content. Elizabeth requests make their return here, and they serve as a nice distraction, and a way to get some extra experience, accessories, and new personas. My personal favorite requests are the ones where you do optional boss battles with strong shadows, and even Elizabeth herself. Elizabeth was Persona 3's ultimate boss, but now acts as a sort of skill check for the player. There are a few of these fights throughout the game, with the last one being unlocked once you load a completed save file. I found all of these really entertaining, because she uses the persona that you'll get as a reward against you. It's a cool way of showing off what it can do before you fuse it yourself. When both protagonists are at level 55, you unlock the request to battle Margaret. Do this one as soon as you unlock it. Despite the handicap of being limited to using only two characters, the fight isn't hard at all. Plus the reward you get is insane because that's how you unlock the character's ultimate personas. It's pretty ridiculous that a reward this good is locked behind such an easy task, but hey, I'm not complaining. Once you finish the game with both protagonists, you unlock the optional boss battle against all three Velvet siblings. I haven't done this myself yet because the thought of 
doing another full playthrough of this game makes me sick, but the fight itself does look pretty fun. You're certainly getting your money's worth at least if you decide to play Persona Q. When it comes to the gameplay, I think that there's a lot of potential here, but it's nothing great. Credit where credit is due. I think the main combat system is actually pretty fun, despite the balance issues, and that can be fixed by playing on higher difficulties. I just find the dungeon design incredibly frustrating and overall just a chore to get through. Something that I can compliment Persona Q for is its great art direction. The dungeons all visually look distinct and are memorable in their own right. My personal favorite one is the Evil Spirit Club for its great atmosphere. For a 3DS game, the character models all look very good despite the aliasing, and there are a few animated cutscenes sprinkled here and there, though they do suffer a lot from compression. I also really like this new art style as well. It fits the more light-hearted tone that this game has for most of its run, with my personal favorite being Kanji because look at him. All that's left to cover is the story of Persona Q. So once again, I'd like to give a reminder that there are going to be spoilers for the rest of the video. So if Persona Q looks interesting to you, then I recommend you play the game yourself before continuing. Not that there's really much to spoil anyway. I really wasn't kidding when I said that there isn't much in terms of story throughout the main game. Things happen, but it's nothing of substance. Scenes only exist to provide us with fan service or cute moments of the two casts interacting with each other, and in all honesty, there really isn't even much of that. Persona Q is around 50 hours long, and I don't think the game does enough outside of the combat to really justify that runtime. The most disappointing aspect of Persona Q is the characterization of all the party members, as well as how underutilized the concept of bringing them all together really is. It's pretty unanimously agreed that Persona Q really dropped the ball when it came to how the characters were represented. To be fair, there's over 20 characters in this game. I think expecting everyone to get an equal amount of screen time and be written exactly as they were in the main games is a little too much to ask. Even with that considered, I still think Persona Q really doesn't represent these characters in the best light. A good majority of them are boiled down to one or two recognizable character traits. For example, Chie's entire personality has been boiled down to being obsessed with meat and training. While those traits are taken from her original appearance, the problem is that there's nothing else done with her in Persona Q other than using her obsession with meat as a punchline. This rule applies to a good majority of characters in Persona Q. Akihiko was one of my favorite Persona characters, and he's easily the one who suffered the most from this writing style. Taking a complex character whose motivation came from his self-loathing for not being able to protect someone close to him, and converting that into a hot Head who doesn't shut the hell up about protein. For a game that's all about the Persona 3 and Persona 4 cast coming together, there really isn't much in terms of inter-party character interactions. This is such a missed opportunity. There was so much potential in having these characters not only bounce off each other, but also being able to relate to each other's struggles. We could have seen Yukiko and Mitsuru relate to the struggle of living up to the family name. Shinjiro and Kanji could have bonded over the fact they have interest in things that contradict the way they present themselves. The one that really blows me away is the fact that Igis and Teddy have almost no character interaction outside of running gags. These two characters embody the major themes featured in their respective games. I guess is a character about finding meaning in life and discovering the will to live, and Teddy's character is about accepting oneself for who they are, despite their background or negative qualities, showing that everyone is able to change themselves for the better by allowing people into their lives. Whether or not you like the personalities of these characters, I think we can all agree that the idea of bringing them together was wasted. Persona Q does feature these little events known as strolls that you can participate in. These are limited time events that see select characters interacting with each other. They're fun scenes for sure, but are mostly used for fan service and don't exactly scratch my itch for meaningful character moments. However, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge that Persona Q does handle some characters well. I really like what they did to the Velvet siblings in this game. Elizabeth is always fun to watch, and the rewrites to Margaret and Theodore make those characters far more interesting than they ever were. Margaret especially, because she was always one of the weaker attendants when it came to personality in my eyes. But for one moment, Persona Q does legitimately take advantage of the crossover setup. There's an ongoing side story involving the characters Ken and Kanji. It takes advantage of both characters' backstories and culminates in a scene where Ken and Kanji bond over crocheting. While not giving us the whole story, Ken does open up about what happened to his mom and asks Kanji for advice. I like this scene a lot because it actually makes strides to connect these characters other than just using them as jokes. But other than the small moments like this, a lot of the story doesn't really amount to much. I know the counter arguments to my complaints would be to bring up the game's ending. After all is said and done, the characters end up returning to their original timelines and their memories are erased, making the events of Persona Q nothing more than a dream for the protagonists. 
This essentially would make any character development meaningless because it all has to be undone by the end of the story. While this is true, I can't help but feel as though the writers played it too safe here. I understand that there's always a fear of taking a character in a direction that people wouldn't like, but it's at least more interesting than doing absolutely nothing with them. That's not to say that there isn't anything interesting in this story, but the problem lies in the fact that all of the interesting plot threads are introduced and explored near the end of the game. Throughout the dungeon crawling, the chests at the bottom of each labyrinth are actually a personal item that belongs to Rey. The more of these items the group recovers, the more apprehensive Rey becomes about completing the mission. By the time the team manages to clear out the last labyrinth, the truth is revealed. It turns out that Rey is actually the spirit of a girl who died named Nico, and Zen's true identity is the deity Kronos. Kronos was created by the collective unconsciousness, and his role is to guide people into the afterlife. Nico was a girl who died of a terminal illness at a very young age, and lived a life filled with anger and sadness. Saying that Nico was dealt a poor hand in life is underselling it. She dreamed of going to Yasugami High. She wanted to make friends, go to events, and overall just live life to its fullest. But because of her terminal illness, that was ripped away from her. She spent the last of her life contained to her hospital room, resenting everyone who had it better off than she did. Nico begged Kronos for death. She had no idea what her reason for living was thanks to only experiencing suffering. Kronos was filled with human emotions for the first time after seeing Nico's desperation and decided to lock away her memories. Kronos abandoned his duties from then on. He created the fake Yasugami High and the labyrinths to keep their memories from being accessed. Kronos even went as far as splitting off his own power and locking it away in the clock tower. Zen wanted to give Rei the life that she always wanted, in hopes that she could find her own reason for living. But it's because of Zen's other half that the investigation team in Seas ended up in the fake Yasugami High. Kronos summoned these two teams in hopes that they can clear the labyrinths and restore Zen's memory. This information is all dumped on us right after the Inaba Pride exhibit, and it's all very interesting in my opinion. It recontextualizes a lot of events earlier in the game. You can make the comparison that every dungeon is based off of an aspect of Rei's life, and makes for interesting discussion pieces. And since the game actually did spend a good time establishing Zen and Rei as characters and endearing us towards them, we actually care about what their fate is. The final dungeon really isn't about fighting some big bad villain. It's about Zen coming to terms with the duty that he's been running away from, and realizing that he made a mistake by prolonging the inevitable. After all is said and done, Zen is able to tell Rei that though her life was cut short, there was still meaning to her existence. Just her being alive was special. The connections she made, the lives she touched, that was her reason for living. The plot involving Zen and Rei is very compelling to me, but as I said, it takes until the final dungeon for all this to start happening. It makes the finale interesting, but sadly, this makes the rest of the game feel very bare. I really do like the final send-off for Zen and Rei, however. Since all of the shadows are gone, the characters are free to go on one last tour of the culture festival, giving Rei the experiences that she yearned for in life. The credit shows Zen and Rei's journey to the afterlife, where she can finally rest easy. And that's all for Persona Q, and if you really couldn't tell, I'm not exactly a big fan of this game. There are plenty of ideas here that I enjoy, but for everything I like, there's one or two things that are done poorly. The core combat mechanics offer up a lot when it comes to character customization, and is genuinely fun in the moment, even though the difficulty isn't very consistent. But it's pretty much everything else surrounding the combat that either could have used more refining or are just choices I don't agree with. Most disappointingly of all is how wasted this concept was as a crossover. I have certain expectations when it comes to story and Persona titles. Spin-off or otherwise, if I'm playing what's sold to me as a Persona game that's also an RPG, I'm going to compare it to those other games that I love. And by doing so, I found that there was a lot of things I didn't like. If you're just looking for some Persona fan service and can put up with the gameplay quirks PQ brings to the table, then I think you can find some enjoyment here. As someone who was looking for some substance with that fan service, I can say that I'm disappointed with the results. Despite how harsh I've been to Persona Q in this video, I won't say that this is some terrible or irredeemable game. But out of all of the games I played from this series, this one sadly does rank pretty low on my list. To those who legitimately enjoy Persona Q, more power to you. I'm glad that you found something here that I couldn't. From what I've heard, Persona Q2 does fix a lot of the issues I've mentioned in this video, and I do plan to get to it eventually. But it's not a priority for me. But as of right now, I think it's been long enough since the Persona 4 video. Wouldn't you agree? We all know what's coming next. So I'll see you then. 
Hey everyone, thanks for watching! I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my patrons whose names are on screen now. If you'd like to support the channel and receive some special perks, such as early video access, a special Discord rule, and even some exclusive behind the scenes videos, please click the link in the description. So yeah, the next video is going to be on Persona 5 Royal. This has easily been my most requested video topic, and I'm very eager to get a start on that project. It's going to take me at least a few months to complete that video, so I decided to put a lot of content out for April to help with the wait. That's why the upload schedule has been pretty frequent lately. There's also going to be a couple live streams while I work on Persona 5, mostly to give myself a break and also to make sure the video drought won't be so bad. If you want to keep up to date with that Persona 5 video, please follow my Twitter or check out my Discord server. Both links will be in the description. Once again, thank you so much for watching and take care!